Now, most people would think that when we became members of the Nation of Islam, we were joining the Nation of Islam. Oh, no. Not so. We did not, we did, we were not joining. We had to apply for membership. And to apply for membership, we had to write that letter. And that letter was either accepted or rejected. If the letter was accepted, then you became a member. If it was rejected, then you had to start all over again. So we were accepted as members into the nation of Islam. So Malcolm, traveling back and forth from Detroit to the Chicago home of Dr. Elijah Muhammad for personal training and guidance, rose quickly through the ranks of Temple Number no. One, becoming the assistant minister to Minister Lemuel, to Minister Lemuel Hassan, less than one year out of prison. Come on, wow! Because he was an activist, Malcolm brought more people to the temple meetings than anyone. In less than three months, the temple attendance tripled. The Abelaj Muhammad saw promise in Malcolm and his desire to help. So he sent him to where he could do the most good, to the East Coast. First to Boston, where they were meeting in a house. Then to Philadelphia, meeting in a house. And finally to Temple Number 7 in Harlem, New York. While he was in, in Philadelphia, with Malcolm's work and effort and contact and encouragement and talk and bringing people off the streets into the house, they outgrew the house before he left. When he was in Boston, the same thing happened. They outgrew the house before he left. And before he left, they had a street address. For the temple. Mm -hmm. Then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad sent him to Harlem, New York. When Malcolm got to Harlem, New York, Malcolm said years later that he had finally made it to his place of destiny. Malcolm was a talker, yes, but he was also a worker and a builder. He was never satisfied with the status quo. He knew that in order for the nation of Islam to grow, we had to go out after new people, the young people, invite them to the temple and convince them that the temple message was the message for them. He was tireless in his efforts and he sought out brothers that had that same spirit. The East Coast began to blossom, the East Coast began to grow, and to prosper. But it was not about Malcolm, as many people claim. It was not about Malcolm. The message was, make all that come do all he or she can for the cause of Islam. So it was about the cause, not about the individual. It was the cause for which this work was done, not the personality. No one was building a personality cult. The joy was in the results of the work. Malcolm did not put the position or the title of minister ahead of the effort of work. The minister title didn't mean anything if it did not produce a result. It's like anything, any other profession, especially the profession of farmer. You couldn't call yourself a farmer unless you cleared, cleared the, uh, the, uh, the field, unless you furrowed and plowed the rows, planted the seeds, cultivated the plants, and bring in the harvest. Then you have results. Then you can call yourself a farmer. But until those things are done by th that the man, he cannot call himself the farmer, same as any other profession. If you call yourself a carpenter and never seen building a house or even building a shed, you just have a name and name only. Malcolm didn't believe that. And all of the young men that he attracted to the nation of Islam 
believed as he believed that in order to help the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you have to do more than to sit around and rely on a title. You have to get out into the streets where the people were and bring them into the temple and teach them and send them out in the streets to do the same thing. I was introduced to the message of the Nation of Islam in 1954. In 1955, Minister Malcolm came to Hartford, Connecticut. He had been invited there by the Grand Sheikh of the Morris Science Temple, the Morris Americans, as a guest speaker. He was 29 years old at the time, and the minister of Temple Number 7. In the audience that night was my mother, my aunt, who had been members for 12 years of the Moorish Science Temple, and another sister by the name of Sister Rosalie Glover. All of these were women over 50 years old. My mother and many other Moorish American members, after listening and hearing Malcolm, wanted the Grand Sheikh to invite Malcolm back again. But the Sheikh said no. He said Malcolm would steal all our followers. <laughs> so my mother, my aunt, and another sister named Rosalie invited Minister Malcolm to come back, but this time to their home. The following week, Minister Malcolm returned to Harvard, Connecticut, to a packed living room house. That's how the meeting, that's how the temple got started in Hartford, Connecticut. He told them that he would continue to come if they continued to bring new people to the meeting. This is how he began to generate that spirit in them to go out and bring new people in that had never heard the message before. You know, my mother at that time had birthed 13 children with my father, and she was a committed activist. She was a member of the Marcus Garvey movement in the late 1920s in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who was recruited by her, by her brother. And after spending 10 years in South Carolina due to the Depression, she and my father moved to Connecticut where she met and embraced the teachings of Noble Drew Ali the late leader of the Moorish Americans in 1942. Until 1954, when she heard Minister Malcolm and accepted the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, she was a Moorish American, a Moorish American recruiter. She was a recruiter for the Marcus Garvey movement. She was not satisfied in just being a member. She wanted to be a working member. She was a working member there in Marcus Garvey. I was a member of the Women's Auxiliary. Marched and recruited other women into the organization. During this time, she became pregnant with me. And I'm marching with her. After being a recruiter for those two organizations, the Moorish Americans and the Margaret Gabriel organization, when she joined the Nation of Islam, she became a recruiter for the Nation of Islam. She invited all of her children, first of all, as well as their husbands and wives, to the meetings. And none would come. All she said she wanted us to do was come one time, and she would stop bothering us. Because we told her that her continual invitation was a bother. And we didn't realize it was hurting her feelings. Still, not one of her children went with her. But she didn't give up. She continued to press the issue. In February of 1956, my mother and a contingent of new followers from Harvard, Connecticut, Went to Chicago.